All right, welcome to Breakshift's Tempest Artifact tier list. This one's going to go a lot like the hidden one. Uh, we've got all of our tiers here. It's going to be a general estimate of how much your win percent chance will go up on a run if you find this particular relic. Uh, they're going to be ranked with respect to their rarities. And uh, before we dive in, I also want to give a quick shout out to longtime viewer Divine Shield, who has put together a pretty cool spreadsheet that actually has all of the tiering information I've done so far for cards and relics. Uh, it's got timestamped links to all the videos and stuff. Really cool. I'm going to put that in the description here as well as for the other videos. Uh, make sure to check that out. But with that being said, let's get started. Uh, the first relic we have is the Codex of Ultimate Fervor, which I'm putting in A tier here. Uh, this is a rare relic. It unlocks all your zeal powers, and at the start of each turn, you get two free zeal. So two very different effects, uh, both quite powerful, actually. Unlocking all of your zeal powers is actually a bit of a smaller effect than you would often imagine. It's If you're diligent with planning things out ahead of time, it's not that hard to end up in a situation where you know exactly which powers you want ahead of time, and you get all of those powers. The real benefit of the unlocking all zeal power thing comes in, I would say, two primary ways, which is one, uh, it can be just kind of like a little gravy, where, say, you aren't generating all that much zeal and you didn't bother unlocking a 10 because you don't think it really matters, all of a sudden, you have access to a 10, right? So it can it can help you out a little bit in there. And the other thing it lets you do is it lets you, uh, in, in much the same way that you might tech your deck to fight one particular enemy, you can kind of do something similar with your zeal powers. Some powers will be better or worse against particular fights. Uh, so that's kind of handy as well. Very infrequently are you going to, like, unlock a zeal and then want to go back and change it or... Will you have evaluated something as being a particularly important zeal and you haven't already uh, accounted for unlocking it? Maybe uh, you find this thing at like a soul collector and it lets you change some later pathing that you had planned out because you don't need to get fervor anymore and now you can get value out of some other nodes or something. Uh, yeah, so, you know, it definitely has its upsides, but it's not actually massive. Uh, plus two zeal every turn is, is a lot bigger deal for a lot of decks than the unlocking all zeal powers thing. Being able to uh, very reliably hit your seven like almost every single turn, if you have like any decent zeal generation, plus two every turn, you're, you're probably hitting seven. More often than not, you're gonna be hitting your 10 as well, probably 50, 60 or more percent of the time. Uh, it's a pretty big high roll, I guess, to get this thing off of like a dark idol. That's about the earliest you could ever hope to get this. In that case, unlocking all the zeal powers will be pretty cool. Uh, but more often than not, now you'll get this towards the uh, last like third of your run, and it'll be pretty decent. So it's it's pretty much never bad. It gets to be at the very least A tier for that. Uh, but it's not quite the insane high roll that some of the other rares are going to be. Next, we've got the Champion's Banner which I'm putting in B tier here. It double triggers your three and five zeals. So the first time you hit them, they trigger an extra time. That is a pretty difficult effect to evaluate. Uh, I guess I almost could have had a special tier for Tempest as well. Instead of bleed, it'd be zeal, where it, the value depends on your zeal tree. But I don't think there's actually enough variance in how valuable the zeal powers are for that to make sense. Um, so I, I can say, I think that a across the vast majority of your runs, the champion's banner is just all right. There are going to be occasions where, uh, it is almost worthless to double dip on a three or five. Like for example, if you have touch of war, the, uh, zeal that applies vulnerable as your zeal three that's pretty useless to double trigger. You're almost always going to be hitting that zeal three before you can deal your big damage. Uh, double dipping for an extra stack of vulnerable doesn't matter. You don't need vulnerable the last turn over turn because you can just apply it every turn at the start. So uh, yeah, that's a situation like that, 
really low value use of this thing. Maybe you have an overcharging zeal or something on your zeal 3 or 5, and then suddenly this is really good, because you're almost always going to be able to make use of extra overcharge. Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty volatile uh, in the extremes, depending on exactly what deck you have and exactly what tree you have, but over the course of the entire run, you'll probably eke out some pretty decent value, and on rare occasion, you'll have runs that just go absolutely ham with this thing, but more often than not, it's it's just going to be alright, if you ask me. Uh, the, the crazy high rolls would probably be stuff like Electro Metronome, right? Things that care about you triggering zeal powers regardless of what that zeal power actually does. Uh, if you could assemble some kind of combo like that, I guess you'd be quite happy. Uh, next is the Power Glove. The Power Glove goes straight into S tier. This thing's crazy. This is pretty much the generically best rare relic for Tempest, I would say. Uh, plus two energy at the start of each turn. Next card costs one more. So obviously, if you're thinking of that just in terms of energy gained, plus two, but then minus one for the cost increases, plus one energy for turn, that's pretty good. Uh, but it's better than that because since your card costs more, you're gaining extra zeal off of it, so it's basically plus one energy and plus one zeal at, like, the absolute worst. Uh, you can do things like play X cost cards to dodge that, uh, plus cost if you want, in which case you're actually getting, like, two energy per turn, which is quite a bit better. Uh, you can use it to trigger your tempo synergies, so anything that cares about its cost being modified or playing cards with modified cost really loves this thing. Uh, it lets you dump harder into your X-Cost cards. It lets you play some of her really expensive stuff, like Limit Break, more easily. Uh, it is just an extremely good all-around utility effect to have. You'll pretty much always be able to make very significant use of this thing. Next, we have our first Elite Relic, the Hand Crank Lantern. I'm putting this one in B tier as well. Uh, the first time each turn you hit 50% Rage over charge 1, so that is not a particularly impressive effect if you ask me. Plus 1 overcharge every turn is, is pretty good, but uh, this is far from a guarantee. Uh, if you're on the deck that starts with charges, it's quite a bit more difficult to get that 50% Rage, assuming that your zeal tree hasn't worked out to give you a bunch of rage, or that you don't have a bunch of rage or redstones or something that you've already found, right? Uh, it, it can actually be pretty tricky to get to 50% rage. 25 is not that hard, but 50 is actually a bit of an ask sometimes. Uh, there are a number of ways to make this a lot easier if you get something like the, uh, the lance, where you get 25% rage for your first attack, or... Uh, if you just have those batters, like I mentioned, if you have a redstone that you put on like a rebounding card or something, th there's ways to make it work. And if you have a lot of those ways, then this is a pretty good trickle of overcharge. Uh, but even in that best case scenario, I wouldn't say that it's like, you know, jaw droppingly powerful. So in the worst case, you just skip this thing because it's not gonna do anything for you. And in the best case, it's pretty decent. Uh, that has the makings of a B-tier relic in my eyes. Another elite relic, uh, we have the Dynamo. Uh, this is going to be our first C-tier. Each time you play a buff, overcharge one, draw and discard one. That, I think, mostly speaks for itself as to why I'd put it in C-tier. If you objectively look at what it's doing, it's just not doing very much. How many buffs does a typical Tempest deck have? Usually not that many. Uh, obviously, the one starting deck, you get two Groundeds to start, although I usually recommend upgrading one and cutting the other. So at that point, you just have one buff from the starting deck. Uh, even if you keep both of them around, unless you've picked up another buff, maybe getting two Overcharge and two Draw and Discard from your Elite Relic per fight is not very good. You really need to be getting quite a bit more value than that. Uh, if you've put, like, Blackstones on your buffs, if you've just picked up a whole bunch of other buffs along the way, then, like, maybe you can milk some value out of this, but it's really not very likely that you're in that kind of a situation in the first place. 
Uh, I will at least say that the fact that you're getting draw and discard is quite handy, given that you're usually going to be rigging buffs, at least some number of buffs, right? So being able to sculpt your hand a little bit after you've played out those rigged cards, it can let you find maybe a block card that you're going to need to hold into the next turn, or it can let you find a blackstone buff, you know, dig a little bit deeper for that. Uh, some sort of thing that's going to kickstart your overcharge, whatever other important card you might need. That's kind of handy. Uh, you, you definitely value that draw and discard at the beginning pretty highly. Uh, but yeah, I mean, especially we just looked at a different elite relic that uh, just generates overcharge as well. If you compare the overcharge generation you could expect per fight between a hand crank lantern and a dynamo, it's not a very good comparison. So unless you're just absolutely loaded up on buffs, I uh, can't say I would suggest you go after dynamo very often. All right, next we have the Energy Redirector, which is an elite relic. I'm gonna put this one in B tier. The first time each turn you discharge, you get six shock on the highest HP enemy. Uh, that's actually quite a bit of shock. Six is a large number and you're getting it essentially for free because presumably you already wanted to play this discharge card or uh, if you have some sort of relic that's causing you to discharge uh, that's triggering passively, right? That was already going to happen. You're just getting some extra free value on top of it. In those kind of circumstances, this is a really nice effect, right? Like, if you just happen to have a lot of good cards that involve discharging, if you just happen to have relics that involve discharging, or even zeal powers, there's a couple of those that make you discharge. Uh, this is just going to be, you know, a really good bonus to throw in there. Free shock. Even if your deck isn't, like, specifically very good at taking advantage of shock, it's still free damage. Free damage is very nice to have. Uh, you can lean into this thing. You can play uh, additional discharge stuff that might have been borderline but now becomes good. And that's that's not at all unreasonable to do. It's, it's worth the payoff in most cases to do that, I would say, in fact. If you have a card that's, like, questionable, this alone would usually tip it over the edge. Uh, but... It can actually be a little bit difficult to have reliable discharge. Uh, finding discharge in general is not necessarily super difficult, but you might end up with stuff like uh, Grease Lightning, where you know it's uh, five discharge all at once, and in that kind of situation, you're going to be building up a bunch of overcharge and then spending it on this one card, which means you're not actually going to be getting a lot of value out of the Energy Redirector in that kind of a circumstance. So... Because of that situational as aspect to it, and the fact that the uh, benefit can be a good bit weaker uh, just based on like which starting deck you pick or what your random zeal tree happens to be, uh, it has to stay in B tier, but it is a pretty good effect in general. I do like this relic. Next we have the Conductive Paste, another Elite one. This one's A tier for sure. Each time you apply Shock, apply one more. Uh, that is a... A really strong, very simple effect to have. Uh, shock is fairly often, I would say, a very big source of damage for Tempest. And it is pretty difficult to get large amounts of shock all at once. Uh, in most cases, you're applying small or medium amounts repeatedly. Even in cases where you are dumping a whole bunch of shock at once. So, uh, say you're playing like a... Uh, Tempest, I think, is the name of the card, right? Uh, where it's like the X cost one that applies a bunch of shock. Let me let me actually get the, read the text out. Or not Tempest, that's the name of the character. What am I talking about? It's called uh, <laughs> Holy cow! What is it called? Uh, Rolling Thunder, right? Overcharge one and three shock because it happens X times. That goes to overcharge one and four shock X times. Uh, so even in the case where you are dumping a bunch of shock at once, it's still interacting favorably with the Conductive Paste. Uh, if you have uh, Zeal Powers that are applying shock, that just happens every turn passively, potentially triggering twice uh, with two different powers, or if you have any kind of artifacts that interact with that, then the Conductive Paste is going to work well with that. Uh, it just generally takes something that you already want to do and makes you that much better at it. Really like this one. If you have very few shock sources, obviously you don't take it. 
but uh, more often than not, if you see this thing, you probably already have a few ways to take advantage of it, and you're almost certainly going to end up with more as the run goes on. So generally very strong. Another elite next, we have the Paired Rapiers. This is going to be B tier. Every third time you gain rage, you gain twice as much, but this doesn't count delay rage. Very important. Uh, how much rage you're actually able to get out of this thing, usually it's actually not that much. It's a little finicky to manipulate this thing. Tempest definitely has some very big rage gaining effects that you can use this with. Stuff like Limit Break, you know. Stuff that uh, scales with energy cost. Um, so you, you could, in theory, end up with a lot of rage. But the fact that it's every third time can make it a little bit tricky. Uh, especially when you throw into the mix stuff like Zeal Powers that happen passively. Uh, you can end up accidentally wasting the paired rapiers right before you gain your big rage and you're doubling 25 instead of doubling like 100. Uh, one way or another, of course, you know, more rage is always good. So it definitely does get to at least be B tier, assuming you have just even the slightest bit of rage gain. Uh, you will appreciate the extra damage in the same way that even if you just have a decent amount of discharge, you'll appreciate the extra damage on that energy redirector that we were talking about earlier. Uh, so, you know, it makes sense to, to put them near one another. They're both essentially just a little bit of extra damage here and there, at worst, and at best, they're quite a bit of extra damage. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say that they're, they're very comparable in that regard, and thus they will occupy the same tier. Next is the Divine Hammer. This is going to be our second C tier, another elite artifact. If you play an X cost card for three or more energy, you overcharge one and you zeal two. This is a tricky one because I have certainly had decks where this thing went absolutely crazy. And I've had plenty of other situations where it wasn't even a remote consideration as my pick. Uh, so, you'll, it, it kind of has a lot of similarities with the Dynamo here in C tier as its companion, uh, which is they're both generating overcharge, one overcharge per time they trigger, and some additional other effect. Uh, in this case, it's the two zeal. So, if you've just played an X cost card for at minimum three energy, that's three zeal plus two from this hammer, so now you're up to five at minimum. That can be decent, right? But a lot of the time when you're playing an X cost, you are dumping a lot into it. You're playing a big smite to end the fight or something. You're uh, playing, you know, a retaliate. You're dumping a whole bunch into it. And in those cases, the extra zeal might not matter at all. There's a decent chance you've already hit all of the zeal powers that you have unlocked, right? Uh, getting up to seven, not at all unreasonable, uh, even before the zeal two is coming into play from the hammer. Uh, obviously, if you're ending the fight with your X cost card, too, you're not getting any value from this thing at all. You don't need overcharge in Zeal if you've just killed everyone. Um, and if you do have, like, a lot of X cost cards, uh, it also is still difficult to, like, milk this thing in a way, like... It's not once per turn, right? But if you have multiple X cost cards in your hand, it's going to be difficult to dump three energy into one and then still have enough uh, stuff to purge or enough energy gain that you can dump three into another one. Uh, so more often than not, you won't actually be triggering this more than once per turn anyway. Um, the notable exception is hope, of course. Hope is ridiculous with this. If you have hope, uh, Divine Hammer can actually go off pretty hard, especially once you've upgraded the hope. Uh, that being said, I don't think that one interaction is enough to lift this out of C tier. Because even then, even if you do have an upgraded hope or multiple upgraded hopes, there's actually still a decent chance that a different elite relic would have just been a better choice anyway. You don't want to fall in the trap of picking this thing just because you can enable it. Even when it's at its best, there's plenty of other stuff that might be better. So, yeah, this... You know, like, the, the Zeal 2, for example, like, are you really going to need that when you're playing Upgraded Hopes? Probably not. You're, you're probably going to have already plenty of Zeal. Uh, yeah, anyway, so that's a C tier. Next, we have the Scutum of Faith. This one will be B. At the end of your turn, delay block equal to half of your Zeal. 
Uh, that's quite a lot of delay block, actually. Some of the more innocuous elite relics out there uh, can end up being pretty strong. A lot of the defensive ones, stuff like the uh, the flame shield, uh, where it's just passive block coming in, you know, things like the watcher. Uh, they, they end up being really strong, actually, because the less you have to focus on blocking, you know, small incidental amounts of damage, the more you can focus on offense. And the faster you kill enemies, of course, the less likely you are to have taken any damage at all. Uh, it ends up being a really nice efficiency booster, being able to just have some free block here and there. It saves you a little bit of energy, which lets you deal with the enemies faster. And this is a really good one of those uh, sort of small incidental defensive effects. Half zeal uh, is very scalable as your run progresses. You tend to generate more and more zeal. It's not at all uncommon to have endgame decks that are dishing out like, you know, 20 zeal in a turn or something. Uh, and that would turn into a whopping 10 delay block, which is a ton. But even before that, when you're in the early game, uh, almost always, this is at least, you know, three-ish delay block. Two or three. So that's not bad at all. Because uh, in the early game, of course, the amount you need to block for is lessened. So uh, you're still going to be getting somewhat comparable amounts of value out of this thing at all points throughout the run. Uh, I, I really like this one. It's a great just sort of default pick if you don't have any like strong inclination towards any particular relic. Hard to go wrong with this guy. All right, next up we've got Iron Scabbard. This is another elite, and we're putting it in C tier. This one says every fourth time you play a block card, recur a random heavy card. Uh, it's a pretty situational and kind of awkward effect. You need to have a heavy card in the discard pile, and you need to have played four total block cards, which is actually quite a bit. Uh, Tempest has quite a few expensive, dense block cards. You've got two, uh, three, and even four cost blocks that are not uncommon to find in your deck, especially because one of your starting decks has a two cost block as its default. So it's not all that easy to just spam out a bunch of blocks with this thing. You know, if you have, like, Surefoot or something like that, right? Upgraded Surefoot, you'd be pretty happy maybe with an Iron Scabbard, but that's not very reliable. Uh, Tempest has a, a more difficult time spamming out blocks. Having a heavy card in the discard pile is not the most difficult thing to do. You'll almost always have a decent handful of heavy cards in your deck, and even if there's one in the hand, you can just purge it. To then recur it immediately and at least you're getting some energy value in that circumstance uh, but yeah you know being able to line it up exactly such that you're playing block cards and you're actually gaining efficient block from them and not just you know over blocking in massive amounts just to trigger this thing and then getting a card back that's relevant is actually kind of difficult right if the heavy card you're getting back isn't relevant in terms of like you know dealing damage or whatever on the turn you get it because who knows can you even afford it right you just spent however much energy on block cards so then what you're just purging the card and it's just a very weird roundabout way of gaining an energy uh yeah i don't know i'm not a big fan of this one it's not terrible you know it, it will just randomly trigger every now and then in almost every tempest deck and it'll at least be worth something but i think you could do a lot better usually Next is the Doomsday Pamphlet, another elite one, and it's also another C-tier one. A lot of C-tiers already. Uh, this one says, each time you expel a card, you delay Rage 25 and Zeal 2. Uh, this this is one of the, the weakest artifacts in the game, if you ask me, relative to its tiering. It's such a small effect. Uh, 25 delay Rage is honestly not that much for Tempest, given how much rage she can generate. This is like, obviously it's the smallest increment the game ever gives you, 25. Uh, the Zeal 2, again, right, like, it's okay. Uh, there are some expensive expel cards, right, if you've just played like a Tower Shield or something, or if you just played like a Cadence, then, you know, it's questionable how much you need that Zeal because you already just generated a bunch of Zeal by playing this expensive card. Um, it doesn't really have any specific way of leaning into it. Tempest doesn't have a particularly large amount of expel, 
and the it's very unlikely that a card you didn't want to run would suddenly become worth it just because you could use it with Doomsday Pamphlet. Uh, so that's unlike something like the Energy Redirector we were talking about earlier. A card that's like questionable uh, but happens to have Discharge and works with a Redirector, it's pretty easy to say, okay, that makes the difference for me. A questionable card with Expel, you're probably not going to go, oh, wow, Doomsday Pamphlet, I got to play this now. <laughs> um, this, this has got to be the thing I skipped more often than any other Elite Relic in the game. It's just so infrequently worth it. Just doesn't do enough, man. This this is like glass prism tier, if you ask me, where I wouldn't be surprised if it, it could drop all the way down to common and still be okay. Uh, next up, we have the Tesla Trident. B tier, Elite Relic. Start of each turn, discharge one, gain one energy. So, overcharge, obviously, uh, turns into energy over time. The Tesla Trident just kind of speeds up that process, more energy now. Uh, and if you know anything about economics, you know that stuff that you have right now is more valuable than stuff that you might have in the future. So that applies here perfectly. Getting the energy right now instead of waiting a turn to have the overcharge naturally convert into energy is a good deal. Especially given how quickly Tempest often plows through fights. Uh, there's a pretty good chance you were never going to get that overcharge energy anyway because you were going to end the fight with like, you know, five or six extra overcharge. Uh, this can be a bit tricky to work with sometimes because you do need quite a bit of overcharge regeneration in order to even have the opportunity to take advantage of this. And especially in the early game, you might not want to be discharging because you might have cards that need to be discharging instead of this thing in order to gain their good effects. You might have cards that care about you having overcharge, like the uh, good old planned strike and what have you, the uh, powered strike, all the various overcharge synergies. Uh, so yeah, you're not always going to take this eh, for those reasons, but especially by the late game, this is very often a really nice pickup, just accelerates the, uh, the energy gain allows you to end fights that much more quickly. Very, very strong in most cases, but it can definitely be a downside, especially early on. So that's why it is B tier. That's like debatably A tier though. Next is the Magnetic Pavis, another C tier. So many C tiers, man. You wouldn't expect it given how strong Tempest is. Uh, I would say that she's definitely in contention for best character. It's either her or Hidden, in terms of their power level. But, uh, it's not necessarily because of the relics. Anyway, the Magnetic Pavis is an elite that says, each time shock is reduced on an enemy, block two. So obviously that's usually going to be because you've triggered the shock on that enemy by hitting them with an attack card. And... Most attack cards only trigger shock once, of course, if an attack happens multiple times, either through triggers or it's an X cost or something, you can get extra block out of this thing, but only as long as they had enough shock that you could trigger it that many times. If you only have four shock and you play a card that hits them five times, uh, that's not really going to work out for you. You're still only getting two actual triggers off the Magnetic Pavis. Uh, there are other ways that enemies can have their shock reduced, but they're pretty much irrelevant 99% of the time, so we're just going to ignore those. If you have the Smite in your starting deck, then, you know, I guess maybe this is pretty good in the, like, early to mid game, where your Smite isn't always going to be killing everyone. You could stack some shock on them, and then you gain some block when you play your Smite, and it's like a little mini retaliate. Uh, but realistically, that's not going to happen all that often. Um, if you're able to put a bunch of shock on an enemy and then you're able to hit them a bunch of times in a row, uh, you really probably don't need to be sitting there thinking, hmm, you know, how can I get some block out of this? You should probably just be getting more damage and trying to actually kill them because shock plus multi-hitting moves is usually a recipe to end a fight very quickly. Um, there are some very, like if you have some sort of AoE shock applier, and you're just getting this random shock on an enemy that you didn't really care about. And you can just, you know, hit them to get a little bit of block and preserve a perfect maybe. Or you hit them with an AoE card, like a Quake or something, and you get a little bit of block that way. Like, there's theoretically ways that you can make use of this. 
But yeah, almost always I, I would say uh, you should just be going for damage, and in the fights where it's going to last a long time, the amount of block you're going to get out of this thing isn't actually all that impressive. I mean, you compare this to the Scutum of Faith, the Scutum is going to do a lot better job most of the time in terms of just giving you raw amounts of block. And that just happens passively, right? Like, you will play cards on your turn, which means you will get zeal, which means you will get block. Uh, and the Pavis is far from that. Do you even have shock to apply to an enemy? Are you necessarily hitting that enemy on this turn? Uh, who knows, right? Maybe this isn't doing anything at all. Big question. Even if those things are happening, is it happening on a turn where you actually have threat on the stack? Who knows? So, uh, yeah, not, not so keen on the Pavis. Uh, next we have another elite, the Winged Circlet. This one's also C tier. <laughs> this one says for each overcharge reduced block one. Uh, very similar to the Pavis, I guess, in that it is this small way to get a little bit of value in terms of block. Uh, this one just asking for overcharge reduction obviously that happens at least once every turn if you have overcharge at all because when you start your turn the overcharge goes down so you are probably getting at least one block per turn but you know that's not exactly anything to write home about <laughs> um obviously what you really want to be doing with this is putting it in a deck that is discharging a lot or somehow spending its overcharge in other ways uh that's not something that happens all the time a lot of decks don't really have all that many discharge effects or they just have relatively few expensive over uh discharging effects like the uh grease lightning that we were talking about earlier um it's it's just really not as much value as you would want it to be right i, I said the scutum is kind of like just the the good like default pick uh, and you can see why, because it compares reasonably well against all these other elite block generating artifacts uh, in general, and the like absolute top level ceiling on these more conditional ones like the Pavis and the Winged Circlet is like still questionable if it's even all that much better or better at all than the Scutum. Uh, like you'd have to be discharging a lot to make the Winged Circlet be as good as the Scutum on average. Uh, you know, obviously the, the Scutum is delay block instead of immediate block, so you could argue that there's benefit to that, but given that the Scutum triggers every turn, and including turn one, when you don't have any threat on the stack to worry about immediately blocking anyway, unless you're playing with Ambush because you're a crazy person, then it doesn't really matter that it's delay block. Uh, yeah, just... Uh, the numbers, man, the numbers just do not stack up in favor of these guys. Winged Circlet, Pavis, and some other stuff that we might get to. Uh, just stick with the Scutum if you see it offered. <laughs> Moving on, we next have the Spirit Flail. Spirit Flail is A tier, finally. <laughs> A good relic. It's been forever since we got an A or S tier, huh? Uh, this one says the first attack plate each turn has Discharge 1 Ghost. So... Pretty comparable to the uh, Trident, except the Trident was just giving you energy. The Spirit Flail is instead giving you back an attack card. So that could be worse than energy sometimes, right? It's a ghosted copy, it's volatile, so if you can't afford to play it or you don't want to play it, it has no value to you except as discard fodder, and Tempest doesn't have a lot of ways to discard for value. Uh, but... If you are able to play the attack, then that's probably going to be really good. It's no secret that black stones are the best stones because they give a card ghost. A lot of times you'll be putting that on attacks in Tempest, and this just does that to whatever attack you want in your hand on any given turn, even if it already has a different stone, including if it already has a black stone, right? You can use this to pretty great effect with uh, a lot of different things. You can use it just with your starting batters to gain extra rage. You can use it on a card like Paragon on a turn when you need block, but you've drawn a bunch of attacks. Or you can use it with stuff that gains overcharge. You can do so many different things with this. Uh, it lets you potentially kill an enemy with an attack, and then you get the ghosted copy, and you hit a different enemy with that for better damage allocation. 
Uh, there's a lot of ways to take advantage of this thing and eke value out of it. Uh, quite, quite handy. Not much else to really say about that. It turns out, you know, just getting, uh, getting ghosted copies of your cards is usually really good. Uh, next we have the Redeemer's Lash. It is another Elite and it is another A tier. If you start your turn with seven or more energy, apply Vulnerable 1 to all enemies. Uh, seven or more energy sounds like a lot, but as you'll quickly figure out once you play Tempest Runs more than, uh, you know, a couple handful of times, it's really not that much. Uh, obviously in the early game it is, but by the late game, it's pretty standard that you'll have the ability, if you choose to do so, to stock up an enormous amount of energy, and you'll have like 20 overcharge or something, uh, and then it starts to seem a lot more reasonable to start your turn with seven or more energy. And the payoff for doing so is massive. Vulnerable one to all enemies is huge. Uh, vulnerable, obviously, is a really important thing to have access to uh, for pretty much every character, but for Tempest in particular, who focuses so much on just dealing raw physical damage, uh, being able to multiply that is a very big deal. Um, she can sometimes struggle to find it, and this is a really great all-in-one solution. Uh, it lets you do this sort of... Uh, on a turn, off a turn thing that Tempest kind of has built into her character design, where like, you know, you build up overcharge on one turn and then you chew through it on the next. You have the odd and even buffs like uh, grounded and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, you know, you can have one turn where you purge a bunch of cards and build up energy. And then on the next turn, uh, everyone gets vulnerable. You can dump all that energy into expensive attacks and the X cost cards. Uh, it's something that fits very naturally with her play style. Um, it's not even unreasonable to imagine this going off almost every turn because you just float energy waiting for the right moment to, you know, put it all into that X cost or put it into that limit break or something expensive like that. Uh, and in the meanwhile, you'll just be getting a little bit of extra damage constantly as you play your regular attack cards. Pretty good. Uh, the fact that it's one vulnerable doesn't really matter that much because, you know, you're, you're planning this out in advance. So the fact that it isn't triggering enough vulnerable to stack over into the next turn is totally fine. If you need it next turn, just make sure that you're going to have enough energy when you end, and you'll get some more next turn immediately. Uh, it plays around adaptation, of course. Uh, the downside of an effect like this is that if you have all for one, or excuse me, one for all enabled, you'll be getting vulnerable as well. Uh, but, you know, you have at least seven energy at the start of the turn, so... If you have any amount of defense, you'll probably be able to handle that. I really like this one. Uh, next, our first uncommon, the Conductor Stone. We'll put this in the B tier. Green Void Stones also give Overcharge 1. That is a pretty reasonable effect for an uncommon. It's uh, nothing to write home about, but it's not that bad. Usually you'll have, at most, one or two cards with a green stone in them. Uh, if it's a buff and you're just playing that card once and then it's gone, like if you have one single greenstone buff, Conductor Stone not looking too hot. Uh, on the other hand, if it's a card that doesn't expel, then you'll be able to reuse it. Uh, you know, if you have like a, uh, some sort of overcharge gaining thing, like a quick charge or something that you've decided to glue to your opening hand, that's not too bad. You'll be able to reuse that, get some value. Uh, if you have multiple cards with green stones, just getting two overcharge at the start of each fight is pretty okay. The fact that the green stone means it's in your opening hand and you're getting the overcharge right at the start of the fight is pretty relevant. A lot of times you need that overcharge to get off the ground because once you've got the extra energy, then you can play the other cards that generate you more overcharge or you're able to actually play your discharge effect for value or something, right? Uh, just having a little bit to begin with can really snowball the fight in your favor. So given the timing of when you're getting that overcharge, it does kind of make up for the fact that you're not actually getting that much overcharge most of the time. Uh, but not enough to raise it above B tier. Uh, next, we have the Tireless Greaves. The Tireless Greaves uh, are going to be A tier. Another uncommon, each time you gain Tempo, which is the effect that says your next card costs more or less, uh, you get 25% Rage and 25% Delay Rage. Uh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. There's quite a few cards that really enable this thing. 
Uh, power Walk is a great one. Once you've upgraded that, you're gaining tempo constantly uh, while you play the Power Walk. Uh, there's cards that you could put Black Stones on that give you tempo. There's Relics that give you tempo. There's Zeal Powers that give you tempo. Uh, you could be triggering this thing easily two or more times every single turn. And now you're getting 50 uh, Rage, 50 Delay Rage. That's quite a bit of total Rage. If you're triggering this multiple turns, the Delay Rage and Rage will end up stacking onto the same turn. So if you trigger this twice on one turn and then twice on the next turn, you've got 100% Rage on this turn, uh, which is a lot. It is it is just quite a bit of extra damage. That's, uh, that's really all there is to it. Very good effect. Uh, next we have the Warhorn, another uncommon B tier this time. Every seventh card you play gives double its cost in zeal. So this is a bit of a weird one. I was pretty positive about the plus two zeal per turn with the Codex. Uh, but part of what makes the Codex so good is its reliability. It's two every turn. It's not a lot on some turns and nothing on other turns. And that's what the Warhorn is. Warhorn is a lot on some turns and nothing on other turns. Uh, but actually, that's a bit of a charitable interpretation of this thing's effect. Sometimes it's not even all that much when it actually does trigger. If you trigger this on a one or two cost card, you're only getting one or two zeal out of it, and that's not all that good. Um, if you're... If you have like a whole bunch of really cheap stuff somehow, and you're you're just playing cards like crazy, then like in theory you could you know get a lot of zeal out of this thing, or you could manipulate it to play it with your expensive cards. But Tempest really doesn't have the ability to do that. She has very few cheap cards that she can just spam out. Um, there there are a few. You know you can you could be playing Hope for a small amount. You could be doing like Blackstone and her Oasis stuff. Uh, but more often than not, this is just like you know, an average of one or two zeal per turn with no other effects on it, uh, which just make it okay, right? One zeal per turn on average, pretty bad for an uncommon. Two zeal per turn on average, okay for an uncommon with no other effect. Uh, if you if you really need some extra zeal, I guess you just are happy to see this, but it's it's not one of the best ways to get that zeal. All right, moving on. Next, we have the Armored Breastplate. This one will also be B tier. This one's another uncommon. Each time you pay four or more energy for a card, you get an upgraded Volatile Clashing Steel. Clashing Steel being the zero-cost block that says block 12 and your next card costs one more. So, obviously, the idea here is that if you've just spent a bunch of energy on a card, uh... If you haven't ended the fight right then and there, you might be needing to handle some defense now. And what better way to do that than with a zero-cost block 12? That's pretty good, right? Uh, well, yeah, actually, it is pretty good. Even though it makes your next card more expensive, that's fine. That's a problem for future you to worry about, right? If you need the block right now, you'll be pretty happy uh, to just go ahead and get that block immediately and not suffer any consequences until later. Uh, there's ways to take advantage, of course, of that tempo. Plenty of tempo synergies. We've looked at a few relics already that care about tempo, like the Tireless Greaves, so that's pretty good. Uh, the fact that you're getting a block card is relevant, I guess, too, for the things that care about that, like the, uh, Scabbard that we were talking about earlier, uh, like some of the, uh, Zeal Powers that care about playing block cards. There's a few ways to take advantage of it outside of just using it as a blocker. Uh, obviously, it's potentially discard fodder as well if you have a way to discard cards. Uh, the only real caveat to this is that four energy or more for a card is a lot. That's not the easiest thing to trigger. Mostly, that's going to come down to your X costs. There aren't that many individual cards that cost that much. Uh, if you have plus tempo already and you're playing a three cost card, that's another way potentially, right? Like maybe you end your turn using a clashing steel here that you've gotten from the breastplate, and then you start your next turn by playing a three cost card, which has been upped to one, and you'll get another clashing steel immediately. That can be interesting. Um, yeah, uh, it's it's a good effect, but the the difficulty of of really triggering it with any frequency is why it has to be B tier, I would say. That being said, even if you're only using it like once per fight, uh, as long as you're actually getting good value out of this, I think it's an effect that you'll really appreciate. 
right? So it's there when you need it most. So I'll give it B tier. Uh, next, going into some commons here. The Marching Drum. I'll give this one B tier. Very, very simple. Uh, it's one zeal every turn. So, you know, I was just saying that with the Warhorn, if you were getting one zeal out of it every turn, that wouldn't be very good for an uncommon. Uh, but for a common, that's totally acceptable. Uh, it's an incredibly minor effect, but it could be the difference. You know, every single run is going to have at least a dozen or more turns where you end with like six zeal or something, and it would have been pretty nice if you triggered that seven. This will get you there. Very, uh, very simple. Not much else to say about this guy. Uh, and in a very similar vein, we have the flashy baton. It'll be right next to him in B tier. This one is at the start of every even turn. You get two zeal, so it's twice as good of an effect, but it triggers half as often. Uh, perfectly fair side grade there. Um, I would say that the flashy baton is probably slightly better because it's more likely that two kicks you uh, up from one from from not triggering a zeal to triggering a zeal than it is that one does that. So you're probably getting a little bit more value out of the baton than the drum, but they're very, very comparable. And they're both just perfectly serviceable commons. Uh, what's a little better than a serviceable common, though, is the Jousting Lance. We mentioned this guy a little bit earlier. At The, f uh, the first time each turn you play an attack, you get 25 rage. Uh, really good. Really good effect. Um, I think when I first saw this, I uh, overestimated it a little bit. I was like, wow, 25 rage every turn, basically. That's crazy for a common. Uh, it's not quite 25 rage every turn. Uh, late game decks will actually find it a little tricky to make use of this thing. It has some unfavorable interactions with stuff like the, uh, uh, the mace i forget what this thing is called we just talked about it uh the one where it's the first attack that you play has discharge ghost right you want to play a small attack to get the the lance off but you, you don't want to waste that ghost effect on a small attack you want to use it on a, a powerful attack so that, that can be a little bit awkward um it, it, it can be tricky by the time you're in the late game but in the early game it's just like all upside all the time it's really nice uh, it does help you out with those rage synergies. Uh, it's it's pretty strong for a common, I would say. Uh, what's also pretty strong for a common is the next one here, Delicious Crust. If you have less than 5 overcharge at the start of your turn, delay block 4. Uh, that's really good in the early game, man. Not at all uncommon to find yourself with less than 5 overcharge every turn for uh, a good while at the start of the game. And if you're getting four delay block every turn out of a common artifact, that's phenomenal. That's so good for a common. Uh, the downside with this, of course, is that it basically is a ticking time bomb and will eventually just explode and delete itself, essentially, from your <laughs> collection uh, and, and do almost nothing. Uh, but it's, it's always at least going to uh, give you something on the first turn, right? Because you'll always start your turn with less than five overcharge. Usually, uh, I guess, you know, there's the jumper cables and stuff, but usually it's at least four delay block on the first turn, even if it does just stop doing anything from that point on. And that's still pretty okay for a common. But in the early game, wow, what a high roll. It's so strong. Big fan of the crust. All right, moving on, we have the perfect level. Uh, this one I'm going to put in C tier. A common if you end your turn with overcharge equal to a multiple of five delay rage 25 and delay block three uh yeah this one is a bit too situational multiples of five uh nine times out of ten that's going to be exactly five or ten uh pretty infrequent that you'll go very far above that in your typical deck uh, at the very least for most of the run Right, like through all of floor one, pretty much through a lot of floor two, it's it's pretty uncommon that you're going to be getting up to like 15 or more overcharge. Uh, so specifically, having to hit five or ten is mostly what you can think about this for, and it's not all that easy to manipulate the exact amount of overcharge you're gaining. A lot of cards that you just want to play already will happen to have some overcharge on them, especially if you've put like purple stones on things. If you have zeal powers that are giving you overcharge, that just makes it that much trickier to handle. Pretty much, I would say, don't 
bother trying to manipulate stuff just to trigger the perfect level almost ever. Uh, sometimes it's just going to, by pure coincidence, happen that you can make some minor alteration to your plays for the turn and still get a good result. And in that case, sure, go for it. But the vast majority of the time, that's not going to be the case. And after you've done the good play that you should have done, probably regardless of the level, if you so happen to end with 5 or 10 overcharge, congratulations, here's a pretty small effect that you get because of that. 25 delay rage, 3 delay block. Uh, I was really gushing over the crust, giving you 4 delay block every turn. Uh, again, that's good because of its consistency. Uh, this thing being as inconsistent as it is, and it's giving you less delay block, that's not so good. Uh, the delay rage is nice at least, but, you know, again, it's inconsistent. Who knows if you're even gonna have a lot of attacks next turn to take advantage? Who knows if you're even gonna really be able to attack on that turn? Maybe you need to be focusing on defense. Uh, just... just not great. Uh, next one is the granola bar. This one is great, A tier. The first time each battle you reduce your overcharge to zero, you gain two overcharge. It's a common relic. Uh, that's really nice. That's really nice. It is pretty easy in the early game to trigger this effect. You just play any one card that gives you overcharge and you end your turn and then boom, it goes off. Uh, it's not that hard to take advantage of it, even into the later game though, just by playing some stuff that discharges you or by uh, intentionally delaying a little bit of your overcharge gaining effects, right? Uh, a lot of the time you'll be starting out with your uh, rigged cards, so like your buffs and stuff, things that might not be actually gaining you any overcharge. You just toss out one little thing there, you trigger like one zeal power that gives you some overcharge. You're off to the races with the granola bar. Two overcharge from a common relic at the start of a fight is actually quite good. So even though it does ask you to jump through some hoops a little bit, it's not that big of an ask, and the payoff's pretty good, so I like this one. Uh, definitely falls off as the run progresses, but that's okay. Uh, next, the Lemon Battery. This one's also quite good. A lot of good food common relics here, huh? <laughs> uh, the first time each battle you apply Shock, you get eight more. Very simple effect, very powerful effect. Eight Shock is quite a bit. I was saying that six is quite a bit on the Energy Redirector. This is even more than that. Obviously, it only triggers once. Uh, it already requires you to be applying shock, but that's fine. You're going to be putting the shock on the guy that you want to stack it all up on anyway, because each point of shock is better than the last. So just getting an extra eight uh, right out the gate is really good. Um, this is a great way to help yourself out in the early game versus uh, early elites versus your first boss and stuff. This is a pretty significant boost for a common. Big fan. Going back to some uncommons now, we have the hymn book. This is a B tier. Uh, if you end your turn with 2, 4, 6, or 9 zeal, gain 1 energy and delay block 3. Sort of the consolation prize for failing to hit a zeal power threshold. Uh, it's pretty good, actually. Um, being able to gain 1 energy is an effect that's normally associated with your starting zeal 7 power, if you pick that uh, starting deck. So uh, that's, that's pretty valuable, getting something that's equivalent in value to a Zeal 7, but it's actually a little bit better than that because you're getting 3 Delay Block too. Very nice. Um, most of the time, though, this is going to be kind of similar to the level in that I don't think you should really lean into manipulating this thing to try and take advantage of it. It's just going to kind of happen naturally, uh, which is fine because... The payoff for the perfect level was not that good, but the payoff for this thing is that good. So, just a random trickle of energy, not at all bad. Uh, it does also kind of turn itself off for some decks once you get into the late game, when you're generating, you know, 12, 14, 20 overcharge every turn. Uh, obviously, this doesn't work at that point, and that's a bit sad. But it's really strong in the early game, and even with the most overchargiest, zeal spammiest late game decks, you'll usually still have at least a turn or two where uh, you don't generate all that much, and maybe this kicks in then, who knows. It's, it's pretty solid, all things considered. Definitely worth a B tier. Uh, next is the Parade Tuba. Uncommon. This one is C tier. All buff cards give double their cost in zeal. 
Uh, another weird zeal gaining effect that's not exactly reliable. Um, there's plenty of cheap buffs on Tempest. You know, your your uh, shifting winds, your grounded stuff that you don't really get much value out of the parade tuba with. There's some expensive ones like you know Cadence and stuff that you could try to to get some good value out of, but. Uh, how many of those cards do you have in your deck? Almost certainly the answer is zero or one. So you can think of this mostly as like a one-time big infusion of zeal in those cases. Otherwise, it's just like a very small trickle of zeal. Uh, it doesn't really do enough for being an uncommon, I would say. Uh, especially if you're rigging those buffs and you're just spamming them all out at the start of the turn. And this just gives you a whole bunch of zeal on turn one when you probably don't even need it. If you're playing all these buffs on the first turn, you don't need stuff like Rage, which you might be getting off of your zeals. You don't need Vulnerable. You don't need Block. Uh, all of these things are, are not super useful to be getting. Uh, there are ways to make this thing work. It can be good, but a lot of the time it's not, I would say. So C tier. Moving on, we got some more rares. First up, we have the Electro Metronome. I love this thing. This thing is an S tier, if you ask me. Uh, every time you trigger a Zeal Power, apply two shock to the highest HP enemy. Uh, you trigger Zeal Powers a lot with Tempest, right? <laughs> uh, especially by the end game, when you're more likely to get your hands on a rare. Uh, getting your 3, your 5, and your 7 every turn is often just kind of a foregone conclusion. Or at least the vast majority of the turns that you spend, you're going to be getting at least 3 zeal powers. 4, pretty frequently too. Uh, it has great synergy with any additional zeal power triggering things. So, Power Spike, the Champion's Banner, uh, Reaffirm, all great ways to get extra value out of the Electro Metronome. And even if you're just regularly using it without any of those interactions, what it does is still really impactful. Two shock to the highest HP enemy. Uh, that's exactly where you want your shock usually is on, you know, the boss and not their minions. It's going to be on, uh, you know, Bruce instead of his, his uh, ghastly piranhas that he summons and stuff like that. It'll go on our chaos instead of his limbs. Uh, stacks it all up. You just hit him with your big card. You end the fight right then and there. Good stuff. Just huge passive value. You don't really have to think about this thing at all. Very, very good. Uh, another really good one is the Stress Toy. Not quite as good, though. It goes in A tier. At the end of each turn, you delay block 4, plus one extra delay block for every 25 rage that you had when you ended your turn. Uh, it's, it's definitely good. Uh, like I've been stressing, this sort of passive blocking effect is actually quite nice. Uh, so that's, you know, that was why I was I was pretty positive on the Scutum. Uh, this being a rare, uh, for four delay block guaranteed every turn, uh, that's not actually necessarily the most favorable comparison with the Scutum by the late game, because you're going to be generating a lot more zeal, which means the Scutum will be giving you a lot more delay block. Uh, but you will also be generating probably a good chunk of rage by that point in the game, and the rage makes up for that by giving you extra delay block that way. Uh, it makes use of Rage on a turn when you might not have been attacking, which is nice. Uh, it has good synergies, of course, with all the other Rage-gaining stuff we have here, like the Lance, like the Rapiers, all that jazz. Uh, maybe at first glance it doesn't seem rare-worthy, but it is actually quite good. Uh, we also have the Leaky Wires in A tier, uh, Rare Relic, at the end of each turn. If you have even overcharge, you give shock to and weak to to the highest HP enemy. But if you have odd overcharge, you gain one overcharge and apply two vulnerable to the highest HP enemy. So, two completely different but very strong effects. Uh, putting shock on the highest HP enemy, like I said with the Electro Metronome, very good. Uh, in this case, if you're applying shock, you're also getting some weak, which is decent because it lets you spend less energy blocking as you build up to that big kill turn. Um, and then on the other hand, getting uh, the odd effect gives you vulnerable, and vulnerable is really good too. Uh, I was very uh, positive towards the Redeemer's Lash as being a good source of vulnerable. Uh, Leaky Wire is also a pretty good source of vulnerable. It gives you two stacks, which is really good because uh, you're not guaranteed to be able to trigger the odd effect twice in a row. 
you might get the even effect next turn, and then you'll be really happy that the overcharge or that the uh, the vulnerable lasted. Uh, similar deal with like the weak and stuff, right? Like if on average you're gonna trigger the even effect and the odd effect an equal number of times, and because you're getting two stacks of weak and two stacks of vulnerable, that means that on average they will be pretty much permanently weak and vulnerable, unless you're playing with adaptation, in which case it's still a pretty good effect, uh, even if it is only lasting for one turn. Um, yeah, uh, not, not quite as strong in terms of damage output, I would say, as the Electro Metronome, but still a reasonable damage dealer, and the nice little benefit of getting the weak sometimes and the overcharge sometimes definitely helps bring it up into A tier for me. Going back to Elite Relics here, we've got the Bulging Capacitor, B for Bulging Capacitor. This one says, every third time you discharge, you don't spend any overcharge. Uh, this one uh, can be really, really strong, actually, if you have that Greased Lightning or you have that Vanguard or something with a high discharge cost. Uh, discharging doesn't happen that frequently, and a lot of times it will be specifically because you just played a card that says Discharge on it. Uh, the Discharging Zeals, I think, are a lot less generally takeable than Discharging cards are, so... Usually you'll be in control of when you discharge, which means that it's not that difficult to line things up so that your expensive discharge costs are the ones that are being made free. And if you're sh if you're saving like five overcharge or something for a big discharge like Grease Lightning, that's a great deal. Really, really good deal. Uh, note, of course, you do actually have to have enough overcharge to have triggered uh, the discharge anyway. You just don't spend that overcharge. So... Uh, you do need to keep that in mind, but uh, I really like this one when you have the correct cards. When you don't have the correct cards, this is just an overcharge generating relic that ends up being kind of mediocre compared to a lot of other similar relics. And because of that, it gets to be B tier. The highs are quite high, the lows are reasonably low, so B tier. Uh, next we have the big tempo payoff elite artifact, the loyalty card. This one's A tier. The first time each turn you play a card with a modified cost, your next card costs minus one. So it doesn't care if it's actually tempo that's modifying the cost or if it's anything else. So that includes stuff like the uh, Eldritch Blessing reducing the cost of a card. That includes the Dolus randomizing the cost of cards in your hand. Uh, pretty nice. Uh, confusion, stuff like that as well. Uh, it can trigger itself. If you end your turn by playing a card with a modified cost, you'll carry over that next card cost minus one effect into the next turn. Next turn, this thing refreshes, you play that card at minus one cost, and the loyalty card triggers again immediately. Pretty cool. Uh, it is just a really nice uh, little effect right there. You're going to be saving a lot of energy off of this thing uh, on average. And for an elite, I think it overperforms in terms of energy savings. So very, very nice. Uh, we got a couple more elites here now. Next, we have the first generation Transformer. This one's an easy C tier, if you ask me. Uh, at the end of turn three specifically, not every third turn, thir turn three only, shock equal to twice your overcharge to the highest HP enemy and equal to your overcharge to other enemies. So this thing specifically wants you to build up a good chunk of overcharge over the course of your first three turns, then end your turn, then you get some shock, and then on turn four, you'll be able to actually take advantage of that shock. So it should be immediately clear what the problem is. This thing literally does not do anything appreciable until turn four. That's bad. That's already, we're off to a horrible start with this thing. Tempest can kill things really fast a lot of the time. It is not at all uncommon to be done with a fight. Uh, by turn three when you're playing Tempest. Especially in the early game, she can just smash through things. Uh, and if you've scaled up with good stuff, even in the late game, you can find yourself smashing through fights really quickly. So uh, not a great start with the first generation Transformer. What it actually does, also a little bit questionable, um, asking you to end your third turn with a lot of overcharge. Who knows if you're going to be able to do that. You know, how did the draw order shake out? Did you did you draw your overcharge cards or not? Did you draw your discharge cards that ended up chewing away that overcharge or not? 
Uh, what is the current state of the fight? Are you going to be able to take advantage of that shock? Or are you going to have to be playing uh, block cards and stuff? And do you even have attack damage right now to be using? Or are you dealing your damage in some other way? There's a number of ways that uh, this thing doesn't pay off all that largely. Um, even when it does trigger. Uh, most of the time, if you make it to that point and you had a good amount of overcharge, you will appreciate the shock. But, uh, you know, the fact that you won't always care when that happens and that you won't always have that much overcharge and that you won't always make it to the end of turn three before you've won, uh, all of that comes together to make this a pretty stinky artifact. <laughs> Uh, next up we have the solar panel, and it's also a pretty stinky artifact. Uh, maybe this one's a little contentious, I don't know, I've, I've had some discussions with people on this one. A lot of people seem to, uh, rate this thing a lot more highly than I do, but I'm not a fan of the solar panel. If you've gained 30 or more zeal this fight at the start of every turn, draw two and discard one. Uh, so what was my big gripe with the first generation Transformer? It doesn't do anything until turn four. Well, ask yourself. How many turns are you going to have to wait on average before the solar panel does something? Uh, probably quite a few, for being honest. In most fights, it's going to take you round about four-ish turns to generate 30 zeal. It's not going to be until the very late game where the math on that is going to change. Uh, in fact, in the early game, it could take you six or more turns to reach 30 zeal. You know? And this doesn't even do anything when you reach 30 zeal. It does something the next turn after you've reached 30 zeal. Uh, what it does, I will say at the very least, is phenomenal. The payoff is great on this. Draw two, discard one is a massive effect. We all love bottle of whiskey, and that's just draw one. This is draw two, discard one. Way, way better. Lets you fix your hand, lets you get rid of artifacts, cycles you through the deck faster. Uh, really, really powerful effect. But it's got a really strong chance of doing literally nothing for the entire run up until maybe like your floor two boss and then you know floor three or something right uh by the time you've gotten there then it's probably going to do something but even then it's it's not out her uh it's not unheard of it's not completely unlikely that this is going to exactly trigger once during a lot of those fights right uh how good is an elite relic that says once during the fight on like the last turn you're gonna draw two and discard one that's, that's still not that great, right? Compared to the bottle of whiskey, which is happening every single turn, if that's, you know, turn three or turn four or whatever when you're getting your uh, solar panel to go off, uh, it's definitely worse than the bottle of whiskey in that case. Obviously, bottle of whiskey is a rare. This is an elite. Uh, you know, just, just to give you a reference point to compare these things to, how good this actually is going to be once you've triggered it. Uh, when I look at this thing, I almost always consider it to be a blank artifact until I get to the void fight essentially, because it's just very difficult to actually trigger this thing. I've even had decks that generated a lot of additional zeal, and most of the time I was still just killing things before the solar panel mattered. Uh, pretty much every time I get this, even, I make a point of counting how many times I'm able to actually use its effect in a meaningful way, right? Was I already winning the fight on that turn? Am I winning the fight before it goes off? Do I, how much did I actually value that effect? And the answer is almost always not very much. Uh, yeah, so it's a C tier, <laughs> if you ask me, right? Because you could say like, oh, it only comes, you know, it only comes into effect at the end, but that's when you need it most. And I guess that's true. You know, Tempest does die in uh, Floor 3 more often than the other characters when she does die. She still wins uh, more often than the other characters overall, but she does die disproportionately often in, in uh, Floor 3. So you can say that that's a reason to go after the... Uh, the solar panel, but I would disagree. I would say that there are other methods that you can pursue that'll give you a better chance of winning in floor three versus this thing that's just dead weight for most of the run. Anyway, next up we have the perpetual motion device. Another elite, this one's B tier. If you end your turn with less than five overcharge, you upgrade a card in your deck. Otherwise you apply shock three to all enemies. Uh, two pretty good effects, actually. They're both quite strong. Uh, they're, they've, they've got a sort of natural scaling to them, kind of like the Scutum. In the early game, you have fewer upgraded cards, so you like that upgrade effect a lot. And you also have less ability to gain overcharge, so you're more likely to get the upgrade effect. And then by the late game, when all your good cards are already upgraded, 
you've got a lot more overcharge and rotation in all likelihood, and that means you're getting three shock to all enemies, which is awesome. That's, you know, nine shock in multi-enemy fights, which is great. Three shock in a single enemy fight is still pretty okay. Uh, this has some very good utility in just about every fight. It also has some fun options where uh, it can upgrade normally unupgradable cards, stuff like uh, sins. A lot of the sins have really crazy effects when upgraded. This is a good way to upgrade them. Uh, if you find a card from like a rare draft or something in the, the Well of Stars at the end of a run and you don't have any more upgrade points to go, this is a way to upgrade that card anyway. Uh, so even in the late game, that upgrade effect does still come in handy sometimes. And uh, obviously, yeah, the shock effect is just really generally good. So it's pretty strong. Uh, the reason it's not an A tier is because that uh, the ability to upgrade a card only from your deck uh, can be pretty awkward in the early game. Uh, obviously, even in the early game, your most important best cards, you'll still be upgrading those first. And so the value of uh, upgrading some slightly less good card in your deck is a little variable. Sometimes it's not actually all that useful. Sometimes you've drawn the other card that you want to be upgrading, and that won't be all that good. Uh, and even in the circumstances where you are able to actually upgrade those cards, whether or not it'll end up being relevant, right? If you upgrade a block card and then you didn't need the block, you upgrade an attack damage card, you're already overkilling. So, a little bit uh, shaky sometimes in the early game, but usually I'm pretty pleased to find this thing. Uh, next we have the Fabled Relic. Fabled Relic will also be B tier. This is a purely zeal generating artifact, an elite artifact. Zeal 1 if you play a non-volatile uncommon, zeal 2 if you play a non-volatile rare. Uh, this can be quite a bit of zeal. It can trigger any number of times per turn. Uh, obviously by the late game you're gonna tend to have more higher rarity cards, so uh, you can end up getting a good chunk of zeal out of this thing. The real question with this is just did you need that zeal? Were you already going to be hitting your high zeals? Uh, would you have rather had some other effect uh, that would be more valuable to you than zeal, even if you aren't hitting those zeal powers? All good questions to ask with this thing. If you have very good zeal powers in the early game and you're worried about your ability to make use of them, this is a really nice pickup. That's where I find myself using it most often. I roll into my early elites and I'm thinking like, man, if I could just trigger that you know, zeal 7 that I'm using here, I'd be in so much better shape, and this is a good pickup in those cases. Uh, the downside, of course, is that you know you might not have the cards you need to trigger this thing in the early game. You might be relying on a lot of commons, uh, but that's you know something that is relatively easy to fix as the run progresses. So I'd, I'd say it's it's a shoe in in the B tier. Uh, what isn't though is the next one here, Miracle Halberd. Or Halberd, excuse me. Miracle Halberd is a C tier, if there was ever a C tier. <laughs> it's an elite artifact. Every third X cost you play counts as X being three higher. So, why is this bad? Well, it's just too difficult to get a lot of X cost cards most of the time. And when you do, that extra plus three is of questionable value. Sometimes you don't need the extra plus three, and it's just being wasted, right? Like, you're already super killing the one main enemy in the multi-enemy fight, and then you just want to be able to handle the other guys next. You're just totally wasting this extra damage, uh, you know, or it's like you're, you're playing an intervention for block or something, and you already have enough uh, block. You can always say, like, oh, well, you can just save up energy and stuff, right? But X costs use all of your energy. So if you have the energy right now and there's nothing else useful to spend it on, it's just going to go away. Uh, so not the easiest thing in the world to manipulate. Um, even if you do just have like one X cost card, then you know you can probably still trigger this about once per fight. Uh, if you were able to trigger this once every fight and get a full three energy worth of value out of this thing, I'd probably call it pretty good. But that doesn't end up being the case most of the time. Decently often you'll have no X cost cards, decently often you'll have exactly one X cost card, and then you won't be able to trigger this once per fight because you're not cycling the deck that much. Uh, as with all the X cost synergies, the things that really change the math on this is pretty much just hope and uh, the upgrade to hope, right? That's two X costs right there, 
Uh, if you have any other X cost card that you want to trigger multiple times, just play the hope. Play the volatile hope that it gives you. Boom, the halberd's ready to go. That's really great. Uh, but that's that's very difficult to actually set up and practice. So this is another one that I skip constantly. And that puts it in the C tier. Closing in towards the end here. We got like 15 more to go. Apocalypse Trumpet. This one's quite good. A tier for this elite artifact. The first time each turn you reach zeal 8, you gain 2 zeal and 25 rage. So if you're able to just creep above your zeal 7, it's going to immediately bump you all the way up to your 10, triggering that last zeal power if you have it unlocked, and giving you some free rage. That's pretty good. Being able to reliably hit 8 or 9 uh, is reasonably common. It's it's not actually all that crazy to have a deck that can hit 8 or 9 somewhat easily, but can't hit 10 most of the time. This can definitely take you from hitting your zeal 10 maybe once every 3 or every 4 turns to hitting it every single turn, and that's a big deal. Even if you're already hitting the zeal uh, 10, of course, you know, you're still getting that 25% rage, which is a decent bonus. Uh, if that was all you were expecting, you wouldn't want to take it, but that's definitely not all you're going to be expecting from this thing. Usually you grab this in the earlier mid-game, when that extra zeal is going to matter a lot, and the rage is just like a good bonus. You know, for that last card you play, now that you've got the all the, all the zeal, you have a little bit of extra bonus damage on it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just good. It's just strong. I like this one quite a bit. I've had plenty of runs that use this thing to great effect. I would say that, uh, you know, comparing it to something like the the Fabled Relic, where it's, like, somewhat inconsistent in terms of how much zeal you're gaining and when you're gaining it, the Trumpet solves both of those problems. You know exactly how much zeal you're getting, you know when you're getting it, you can rely on this thing a lot more, uh, it's a lot better in terms of consistency, so that's why it gets to be A tier. Uh, next up is the To-Do List, a common one. This one's gonna be A tier. At the end of the turn, you get 25 Delay Rage for each untriggered zeal. And if you had 12 or more zeal, you get one Overcharge. Another dual-moded artifact with two pretty good effects. In the very early game, uh, when, you know, maybe you get this thing from a Matron of Memories or whatever, right? Maybe you get it from a chest early on the floor with a relic in it. Uh, this is pretty good because it's uh, not at all unreasonable to end... In the very early game, you can end your turn just having triggered your zeal 3. And even by the mid-game, it's not that crazy to only trigger your 3 and your 5. It happens reasonably often. That would mean you're getting 50% delay rage pretty much every turn from this thing, which is crazy for a common relic. 25 delay rage for a common is what you'd expect. 50 delay rage every turn, really, really good. Uh, then it has this awkward middle ground where if you're hitting, you know, anything above 7 but below 12, it's really bad because it doesn't do anything much. It's just 25 delay rage which is, you know, mediocre-ish. It's okay. But then it comes back around when you start to have really high amounts of zeal in the late game. You're getting overcharge one from this thing every turn. That's pretty solid. That's a very okay effect for a common relic. That's going to outperform some of the other stuff we've talked about here, like the Conductor Stone, right? You're going to be getting more overcharge on average from this to-do list in the late game than you would from a Conductor Stone. So, very good in the early game. Very good in for a common relic in the late game. Uh, that awkward middle ground is really not that bad. You know, you're not going to be missing this thing terribly on the turns when it doesn't trigger, but you're really going to appreciate when it does trigger, so I like this one a lot. Uh, the Blessed Whetstone is up next. I also like this one a lot. Another A tier common. Your first heavy attack each battle also applies weak to, vulnerable to, and slow to. That's a lot of stuff. Uh, the fact that you're getting two stacks is really handy. Uh, almost, even if you're playing with uh, Adaptation on, almost always you'll be triggering this on turn one or turn two, which means that they will definitely have those debuffs for two turns, which is really good. Uh, weak and slow at the same time is really going to lower the damage output on the enemy, which will let you spend a lot more energy dealing damage, which you'll get extra value out of because of that vulnerable. So everything just comes together nicely with this guy. Really big fan. Uh, obviously, if you don't have like any heavy attacks, this would be pretty bad, but you pretty much always have at least a couple with Tempest, and they tend to be some of your better cards. So, big fan of this guy. 
Very, very nice early game upfront effect. Uh, next we have the Improvised Helmet. This one's B tier. Another common artifact. Each time you purge a non x cost card that costs three or more, block two. A uh, lot going on there. But it's pretty reasonable, honestly, for a common. Uh, when, you, when you break it down, you probably have at least a couple uh, cards in your deck that cost three or more. And... In those cases, you know, you won't always be able to play them when you draw them. If you draw an expensive card and you don't have the energy for it, you're probably going to purge it. Why not get a little bit of defense out of that, right? Maybe you don't need the block, maybe you do, uh, but it's at least something, some of the time, right? Whereas otherwise you were getting nothing. It's an effect you were already, it's a thing you were already going to be doing. This way you can just get some value out of it. Uh, where it becomes extra useful, though, is when you throw in some of the, uh, drawing cards the Tempest has, so stuff like Hope, stuff like Inner Oasis, those are both very good with Improvised Helmet because they draw you a bunch of cards but then ask you to purge those cards back because you now need to refill your energy. Improvised Helmet works really well there. Uh, it has some fun interactions with Tempo. If you have plus one Tempo, all of your two cost cards will cost three or more, and until you actually play one of them, then uh, you're going to keep getting the benefit from the Improvised Helmet every time you purge them, so that's pretty cool. Uh, you can even use it with the cards that purge to give you tempo. So one of those cards is purge, gain one energy, and next card costs one more. You purge that, you start purging your two cost, you're getting all sorts of block. Really nice. Uh, in terms of the overall value you're getting from this thing, it's not bringing down the house, but it's a common artifact, you know, right? You can only expect so much, and I think this one performs reasonably well. Next we have the Electric Bagpipes. One of my f uh, oh wait, next is not the electric bagpipes. No, next is the insulator. Oh wait, oh no, there. Okay, whoops, <laughs> I didn't even notice. Next is the electric bagpipes. Uh, it's an S tier. I really like the electric bagpipes. Uh, it's an uncommon artifact. At the start of your turn, you gain plus one energy, but then every third card each turn, you ca uh, or the third card, not every third card, costs one more. This is a really interesting effect, if you ask me. Um, the plus one energy per turn obviously is crazy for an uncommon. You would not expect that level of power. Uh, but then, of course, if you play uh, a card as your third card, you are losing that energy because it costs one more. So immediately, it's obvious. Well, at the very least, this is like plus one zeal per turn, which is, you know, that's common level. That's literally what the marching drum is, right? But that's only in the worst case scenario, right? In the best case scenario, what if you don't play three cards? What if you just play one or two, right? You play one big X cost or one big expensive card, then it was just plus one energy. That's really good. What if you play an X cost as your third card? Then it was just plus one energy. That's really good, right? Like, there's there's so many different ways that you can take advantage of this thing. It triggers your tempo synergies with stuff like, you know, the, uh, the punch card or with the uh, tireless greaves. It gives you extra tempo. It can be dodged so that it's just plus one energy. Uh, there's there's a lot of stuff you can do with it, all pretty powerful. And even in the absolute worst case scenario, it's still giving you a decent-ish effect. You know? At bare minimum, it's an uncommon that performs in the level of a common. And at maximum, it's an uncommon that performs about as good or even better than some elite artifacts. I'd say that is an S-tier worthy artifact, if you ask me. Also, S-tier artwork, dude. Look at that. Amazing. <laughs> Just a big fan of the uh, the bagpipes all around. Okay, now it's actually the Insulator. Insulator's B-tier. Uh, another uncommon. The first time each turn, you apply Shock, block four. Four block every turn, pretty decent. Uh, you're probably not applying Shock every turn in every deck. This is an uncommon, so it's not like you can just pick it if you have a big shock deck like you could an elite artifact that cares about applying shock. Um, so because of that, you know, you will sometimes end up with this in a deck that has very little or no shock, and then it's going to be pretty bad, but if you have just even a decent level of shock application, you're going to be pretty happy with this thing. If you trigger it every turn on average for a block, that's great value. If you trigger it every other turn on average, you know, two block per turn is still pretty okay. Uh, and that's not the biggest ask in the world. Apply shock at least once every other turn. It's not that crazy. It's it's pretty okay, 
all things considered. Uh, next up, we've got the Funeral Pyre. Uncommon, this one I'm going to put in C tier. Uh, each time you kill an enemy, zeal 7. So, presumably, you've played a card to kill that enemy. I guess you could use a spell or something. But you've probably played a card, which means that if that card costs at least 1 energy, you've got at least 8 zeal. Uh, that's triggering 3 of your zeal powers guaranteed. Um, potentially, you know, just giving you a bunch of value. But more often than not, I would say this ends up being excessive zeal or zeal that you can't really take advantage of. Uh, or, you know, obviously in a single target fight, it's worthless because you kill the only enemy and you immediately win. No point in gaining zeal at that stage. Uh, it has some interesting applications in uh, boss fights and stuff where you're going to have minions. This does not care if it's a minion or not. If you kill a bunch of minions over and over again, you'll be getting crazy amounts of zeal. That can be interesting, potentially. Uh, you know, so th this could be your answer to something like the Skeleton King fight, maybe, where you have to kill those minions realistically. Now you're getting a ton of value out of it. That's pretty cool. But that's one fight that you have a decent chance of not facing at all. So... I have to say that more often than not, it is sadly kind of useless... Uh, but, you know, I mean, it has its it has its time to shine. You're just probably not going to find that time. <laughs> Sorry, Funeral Pyre. Next is the Celestial Chimes. Uh, this is going to be B tier. Uncommon. Each time you trigger a zeal power, gain a charge. When you draw an unstoned card, you can spend five charges to add a yellow stone to it. Holds a maximum of ten. So... In a typical turn, you're only going to be triggering three-ish zeal powers, sometimes two, sometimes four. Uh, for a standard run, four is the maximum you can trigger per turn, of course. So you start this thing at zero, you uh, gain four charges on a turn, you gain four charges next turn, the turn after that, you gain one Yellowstone in a card. That's pretty slow, not super impactful potentially, right? But there are a decent number of ways to take advantage of this. Everything I mentioned with the Electro Metronome, so Power Spike, Champion's Banner, uh, the Reaffirm, all that stuff works out. And the charges do carry over from fight to fight. So uh, when you're ending a fight, you're going to be gaining a bunch of zeal to charge this thing up. And you're not going to be drawing a card probably at the end uh, there. You're just going to be killing things, and then you'll start the next fight drawing some cards and potentially putting some yellow stones. Not bad. Uh, the fact, obviously, that it's a stone in the card means that it'll stick around. It's not just four block. It's potentially, you know, eight block, 12 block, however much block. So the longer a fight goes on, the better this is. Uh, versus those really long fights, like versus the Void, of course, uh, there's a reasonable chance you get a good chunk of value out of this thing. Uh, but it is pretty low value in the early game. Like, as a first uh, elite relic versus your first elite, this is probably a pretty terrible choice, if we're being honest. Um, yeah, so that puts it in B tier for me. It's got some decent upside and some notable downsides. Uh, next, the Holiest Offering, another elite. This one's A tier. The first time each turn you reach zeal 6, gain 1 energy. Uh, it's basically just like a bonus zeal power, right? So instead of 3, 5, 7, 10, you have 3, 5, 6, 7, 10. And again, the, uh, that default zeal 7 for one of the starting decks is already just gain 1 energy. So we know that's a pretty good effect. You're getting that exact same effect, and it's cheaper. You only need 6 zeal instead of 7. Uh, getting extra zeal, or extra energy, rather, as soon as you hit zeal 6 is nice, because you could spend that one extra energy on a one-cost card, and now you've hit your zeal 7. Pretty good. Uh, it is, by the late game, more or less just plus one energy every turn. And that's strong. I like this one. It's very simple, very powerful. Uh, and another very simple, very powerful one is the Boomerang. This one's also very good, A tier. The first non-volatile attack card that you play that triggers shock each turn rebounds. Uh, so basically, if you're putting out any reasonable amount of shock at all, this is kind of just a butcher's blade, right? You're just going to be rebounding the first attack card each turn, except in a way it can kind of be better than the butcher's blade sometimes. 
because if there's one enemy with shock and others that don't have shock, you can not have it just be the first card that you play that rebounds. You can manipulate it a little bit, which is nifty. Um, uh, it, it can, of course, have the downside of you draw your cards in the wrong order, you don't get your shock application, you're missing value on this thing. Uh, but usually this will be giving you pretty good value. You can always just rebound or purge the rebounded card, of course. It lets you double trigger void stones. Uh, it is... It's just a really nice, powerful effect. Hard to go wrong with this thing. Moving on, we've got the last seven or so here. The Guardian Dove, A tier. This one is elite. Each time you cast your spell, you get an upgraded intervention, which says uh, block seven X times, expel, purge, zeal one. Uh, this is a really strong effect. So it's not a volatile copy, you'll note. It's a real copy, which means you can purge it to not only gain energy, but also gain that zeal as the purge effect. Uh, or, of course, you can just play it for block, turns any spell into a good panic button block, so you don't have to be using, like, Spirit Ward or whatever other thing like that. You don't have to have the Spirit Shield. You can just have this guy instead. You're still doing whatever normal thing you would with your spell. Uh, you're getting this value out of it now. It's one of the few spell relics that doesn't scale itself off of your spell's cooldown. So if you have a cheap spell in terms of cooldown, like a two-cost cooldown, you're getting even more value out of this thing. If you have the zeal power that reduces your spell's cooldown, that interacts really well with this. You're just going to be getting a lot of free cards, free energy, block when you need it most, free zeal sometimes. It's a very powerful effect. Lots of ways to use it. Quite good. Uh, next, we have the Glorious Banquet. This one's going to be B tier. At the start of your first turn, Zeal 10. It's an interesting effect. Uh, very good in the early game, potentially. Uh, the, the thing that kind of pulls it down into B tier is that when it's at its best in those early game fights, you almost certainly don't have a 10, but uh, you probably will have a 3, 5, 7. You know, you start with a 3 and a 7, of course, and getting that 5 is pretty much always what you do with your first point of fervor, or at least what you should be doing. So immediately getting all three of those triggered, pretty good. If you have any of the things that interact with zeal, like scale based on your amount of zeal you have, like reaffirm, or uh, the one that applies shock equal to your current zeal and stuff, those are really nice to have with this. Good interaction there. Uh, once you do get a 10, of course, this could be something that actually pushes you to get a 10 unlocked instead of upgrading a seven, for example. Uh, then it's going to be really nice if you get one of the high-value 10s. Um, there are some 10s that are not so good to have on this, of course, like the ones that recur stuff. You're not going to have any cards to recur on the first turn, of course. But there are some good ones. There's some high rolls and some low rolls. Uh, you know, the hallmark of a B-tier relic, I would say. It's got some very good upsides, potentially. It's got some, uh, some cases where it's pretty useless. But because it's an elite, of course, you just pick it when your zeal 10s are good. And uh, you'll be reasonably happy with this thing. It helps you chunk through fights that much quicker, which Tempest does often like to do. Finally, getting back to some rares here, we have the Canonizer. This is an A tier for me. The first time each turn you play a card that costs three or more, you delay rage 25 for each energy spent. So at bare minimum, assuming you're triggering this thing, that's 75% delay rage, which is a lot. And it is not at all unreasonable to end your turn with like a big X cost or a limit break or something and get even more, get 100 or uh, 125 even or, you know, way beyond that. You can, uh, you, you can end with like a big X cost that killed one enemy in a multi-enemy fight and then all of a sudden on the next turn you've got, you know, well over 100 rage and it's super easy to mop up the remaining guys. That's really nice. Uh... So, yeah, versus stuff like the uh, the Star Council, where it's like a bunch of equally healthed dudes. Something like this is really valuable. Uh, but just in general, I mean, it's 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 just a lot of delay rage, right? If you, if you don't happen to have that many expensive cards, this is probably worth trying to rebuild your deck, at least to an extent around, putting in more tempo, putting in more X costs, stuff like that. The benefit is very significant if you can manage to trigger it, which 
usually requires at least a little bit of effort if you want to trigger this thing, like every turn, for example. I would say the average deck does not trigger this thing every turn unless you're leaning into it. Uh, but it's worth leaning into, so gets an A tier. Uh, another Elite now, the Expired Coupon. This one's B tier. Each time you play a card with a modified cost, overcharge 1. This one's, like, debatably A tier. Uh, because it's not limited to once per turn. You can theoretically get a whole bunch of overcharge out of this thing. Uh, it's it's kind of similar to the Tireless Greaves, right? Uh, in terms of... They, they're both not once per turn. They both can theoretically give you a lot of value. But the Tireless Greaves being an uncommon, uh, I think, made it stronger. For this thing, uh, getting the overcharge compared to getting Rage and Delay Rage... Uh, it's not actually immediately clear that that's significantly better. Um, so, you know, if you do end up with the right stuff, and you, you're able to just throw out modified cost cards all the time, if you have, like, the if you have the, the punch card and the power glove and all this other stuff, right, then you'll get a lot of overcharge, and you'll be really happy with it. If you don't have a lot of those things, then this is another very mediocre source of overcharge. Uh... Yeah, I, I could see this getting bumped up to A tier, but just not quite, I think. I think it's like a B plus. Next up is the Defibrillator, another Elite. This one's S tier. Uh, this thing's crazy. The first time each turn you hit zero energy, your next card costs two less. That's really good. It is not difficult to hit zero energy. Obviously, any X cost card you play immediately puts you down to zero energy. But moreover, just the way the purging system works in this game, just choosing to play some cards before you purge instead of purging and then playing cards makes it actually fairly easy to uh, get this thing to go off. The only real downside about it is that if you uh, if you trigger it, you need to have a card that costs at least two in hand in order to take advantage of the discount fully so if you don't have that you're only going to save one energy off this thing which is still you know that's fine right that's that's still a pretty reasonable effect being able to get the plus two though makes it a lot better uh so that that can be a little tricky to maneuver around sometimes it also has this weird interaction i only just learned myself where if you're at zero energy and you play a zero cost card it'll trigger so that's a little counterintuitive but interesting maybe you can find some way to make use of that uh, overall, though, I think that the value you can get out of this thing is very strong. Uh, I'm a big fan of it. You know, potentially saving two energy every single turn is a really good effect, so... I put it in S tier. And... The final two relics now are in the home stretch. Thunder God Incarnate. This guy actually is gonna be in B tier as a rare. The first attack each turn applies shock equal to twice its cost, and all enemies spawn with five shock. So that means that at the start of each fight, they all have five, and if you kill an enemy and get reinforcements, they'll also have five. Um, that's like pretty good, I guess, right? You know, I was I was talking up stuff like the energy redirector, which is six shock applied to one enemy every turn potentially this is five shock to everyone to start and five more every time you get respawns but yeah once you start to think about it it's like well okay you know triggering the redirector three times in a fight isn't all that crazy that's actually more shock than the thunder guard incarnate gives you right assuming there aren't any respawns if there's only one enemy in the fight it's not looking too good five shock only without any respawns or anything that's not great uh, so you really are kind of expecting that other effect to carry a lot of the value of this thing. The first attack you play each turn applies shock equal to twice its cost, but it is not actually easy enough to take advantage of that for me to rank this thing in A tier. Don't get me wrong, it is quite powerful. You know, playing a, playing an expensive card like a limit break or an X cost and getting a whole bunch of shock out of it, you know, it's, it's not at all unreasonable to spend like five energy on an x-cost card like a smite or something right and then you're getting 10 shock out of that that's really good right but 
in actuality, a lot of the time you will be playing one and two cost cards, you know, because there's some really good one and two cost cards out there, right? Stuff like uh, uh, Power Strike and Planned Strike and all that stuff, right? Uh, which is really good, but is not going to get you much value out of the Thunder God Incarnate. You get the shock after you play your attack, which means you need to wait around until you play your next attack. So if you just did an expensive X cost, it probably means waiting until next turn. Um, even if it is really just giving you, like, you know, two shock per turn to one enemy, that's still pretty decent. But comparing that to something like the Electro Metronome, you can start to see why it uh, only gets to be in B tier. Finally, we've got the Meteorite. This one's A tier. It's an elite artifact. On turn four, you get one Meteor in your hand, and then on turn five, you add two Meteors to your hand. Meteor is a three-cost card. This is the only way to get it in the game right now. And it says deal 30 damage if you play it, uh, and 10 damage to adjacent enemies, or if you purge it, you deal 10 damage to a random enemy. And it is a heavy card, which is, of course, relevant for Tempest. So, how valuable is Meteor? Um, that's debatable. Obviously, I was harping a lot on the uh, first-generation Transformer for not doing anything until turn 4. Meteorite also doesn't do anything until turn 4, but uh, it doesn't have that added layer of variance uh, that the first-generation Transformer did, where it's like, uh, you know, how much shock am I even getting? How, how am I going to get the overcharge? Is, what's my draw order going to look like? This thing's plain and simple. You just get this big, chunky damage-dealing card in your hand. Uh, at its worst case, you just purge it for plus one energy, and then you get the random 10 damage dealt, which is pretty decent. Uh, you know, modified by rage, modified by shock, because it is an attack card. And... You can, you know, you can discard it. Uh, it also has the nice benefit for it in that if the fight is going long because you're not dealing enough damage, well, suddenly you just have this big expensive damage dealer. So that can bail you out in the early game. Like, I would be much happier picking this up as an early game elite rather than the, the first generation Transformer because this is actually going to end those fights for me potentially, whereas the Transformer is just going to, you know, fart out a little bit of shock <laughs> maybe if even that um overall it's this one i could maybe see putting down into b tier actually right like just as i could see the coupon being maybe a tier this is like an a minus i guess right but it it'll probably come into play you know a decent amount of time when you actually pick it because you'll know when you have a slower deck and that's when you grab this thing and then it'll bail you out a little bit. And then by the late game, you know, there will be a handful of fights where it just is always going to go long, like the Void Fight, of course. And then you just have these extra cards that are offsetting the garbage that's been put into your deck. You've, they've got a pretty good purge effect. They're giving you extra energy on the turns you get them. It's pretty solid. And that does it. That is all of the Tempest Artifacts. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Make sure to check out the uh, Tempest card tier list and the other artifact tier lists we've done. I'll have uh, links to those. Make sure to check out the spreadsheet that Divine Shield made if you want to see all of my uh, tiering information in one convenient spot with timestamp links to all the tier list videos as well. Leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more Vault of the Void content. And I will see you guys all in the next video. Peace.